Uh, Chris is Yelp's head of agency development, and he is joined by a prestigious panel of speakers. So I will let Chris take it away. Thank you, Kadisha. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. As Kadisha mentioned, I am uh, Yelp's head of agency development, uh, a new team here as of two years ago. And I'm super excited today to talk about inclusivity and in advertising, one of my favorite topics, uh, being first generation Filipino American and part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, this is for sure one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, I'm excited to introduce um, our panel today, starting with Shannon Pruitt. She is the Global Chief Content and Partnership Innovation Officer for Stagwell Group. Uh, feel free to say hi really quick, Shannon. Thanks, Chris. Nice Thanks to see you. Ha Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got Lewis Carr, President of Media Sales uh, from BET, so super excited to have him. And last but not least, Bing Chen, uh, CEO of Gold House. Um, very excited to have Bing join us. And we've actually, Yelp has partnered with Gold House to launch our Asian-owned business attribute. So um, excited about the partnership with Gold House and excited to have you, Bing. So let's just dive right in because we've got a lot to cover. Um, so I'll start with um, a question around the advertising landscape. Uh, the landscape has obviously changed around inclusivity over the past few years. Um, how has it changed from your perspective? And do you feel that companies are more effectively speaking to groups that may, be, may have been overlooked previously in traditional advertising, for example, the Asian American community or the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, Bing, let's start with you. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having me, Chris. Uh, it's such a privilege to be here at, Ye uh, at Yelp. Uh, that's also the most impressive marquee I've ever seen in my life, and I've been to Vegas, um, so well done on that. Uh, <laughs> if I were to codify it succinctly, I'd say uh, the last three years or four years in particular have been one of whiplash. Uh, I think we all agree that in these sort of social re-reckonings and reawakenings of Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate, there is, of course, immense capital, talent, and public awareness prioritization of ESG and inclusive priorities. Um, now, those have sort of whiplash actually gone backwards. Uh, you see that the term ESG, which admittedly is not inclusive of only demographic diversity, but also, of course, governmental sustainability and equity, um, has actually plummeted uh, to its lowest since January of 2020 uh, among S&P 500 companies, um, specifically in their earnings calls. On the talent side, we're not to be sort of catastrophic, but seeing a lot of DNIBJ leadership roles folded back into HR and marketing, or you're seeing a lot of top leaders there either be laid off or leave because the work is just too difficult and they're not being set up structurally to be successful. Uh, we've also, on the media side, uh, and sorry, I should say traditional media side, so film, TV network, and so forth side, seeing budgets get slashed. Now, I want to flag that this is partly because of the double strike and also partly because of the challenge capital markets. But nonetheless, the victim of this typically will be folks who are traditional minorities. Um, the the bright spots, I think, are a couple fold, though. I, I think uh, I, I remain convinced that in these contractive phases, whether it's because people have deprioritized ESG because of difficult capital markets, because of double strikes or otherwise, that those of us with more nuanced specific needs, aka those of us with power, but whom incumbents have not necessarily seen, can actually rise to the top and create net new opportunities. So one, why would we be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the, I, I hate to caris, culturally carousel this, but uh, the summer of women women with Barbie that is now uh, Warner Media's highest grossing film in history. This, of course, is a timeless and incredibly powerful IP matched with an incredibly talented female-led and female team. Uh, and we see sort of the amazing output of when that magic happens. Uh, this was, of course, the summer of Beyonce and Taylor Swift, um, which are both respectively the highest grossing tours in history, not just for women, but period. Um, I'm also looking in a region that, Chris, you and I know and love of the incredible opportunities of thinking about inclusion at a global scale, where mm -hmm. if candidly colonialists are not willing to include us, then we will just invest in ourselves and recognize that we're larger. And so I am specifically thinking about South Korea and India, where Netflix is pulling in and continuing to billions of dollars. Many of them are 
in some ways immune to the strike and in many ways because of their tax incentives going to be beneficiaries afterwards. Um, you're also seeing a lot of these non-Western European countries um, start to cross-pollinate themselves. So my favorite data point was last quarter at Spotify, the most streamed category on uh, for India was actually K-pop. Uh, there are suspicions that it's because K-pop music is highly concentric with Bollywood music, where it's very dance-oriented, melodic, very spectacle-oriented. And so this is once again a lesson of, sure, ESG may be diminished in traditional incumbents, but what if we took it upon ourselves to actually invest in ourselves and then cross-pollinate with others who we know also have power? That's super interesting. Huge K-pop fan myself. <laughs> um, Shannon, uh, do you have anything to add to um, the change in the inclusivity advertising landscape? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm aligned to what Bing is saying. And I would say um, all you'll have to do is actually look at Gen Alpha. And Alpha is going to tell you everything you need to know about how globalization works in terms of consumption of culture, um, right? Because it technically, like, even Bar like, about Barbie, K-pop, my 10-year-old is like, we are, we I went to the Blackpink concert. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Nice. <laughs> I was in Dodger Stadium, dressed in black and pink, and had a $65 light stick. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> they are raking in the capital. That's awesome. Um, but I think, you know, I think, I, you know, I think Bing is right. I think the the difficult part is a lot of companies had great intentions and sort of stood up and stood like in a reactive way, stood up divisions. They tried to stand up, um, you know, ex tar you know, targeting, creative, et cetera, to try to be part of contemporary cultural conversation, but that's really all it started. That's what it became as opposed to mm -hmm. when you really start thinking about the numbers and the data and what it's telling you about the rising majority. And, you know, the truth is the the U S Hispanic black and Asian American marketplaces are a $5 trillion economy, which is the third largest global economy. Wow. Like, so if you start to really think about the numbers, the regression is actually disappointing in that <laughs> you know, when we're thinking about the future proofing of businesses, being more invested in those audiences and communities is more important than ever before, right? Really thinking mm -hmm. about how that's, defined, how that's defined in your strategy, simply making statements in quarterly earnings reports or annual reports isn't enough. And that's not going to build the necessary trust and relationship that's going to be required for the future sustainability of businesses, especially in a cookie deprecation world. So I think it's actually... Um, we have seen a change. We have seen a shift. It's it's disappointing in the Super Bowl, right? There was a, a number of conversations going on around how there were no diverse production companies producing Super Bowl spots in the largest platform, wow. right? Whereas a year yeah. and a half ago, that would have not been the conversation because everyone would have been touting the fact that they were doing that, right? So, and I agree with being very much, um, and I'd be curious to hear what Lewis thinks as well, but like, I agree with being very much like we sit in our in our positions in our roles as a place to start to think about like I can think about capital allocation into diverse owned and operated businesses in a way that works with partners like Yelp to actually reinvest those dollars into communities directly right so it's how can we think about our our roles and our our abilities to galvanize capitalize do what we need to do to continue kind of the good march forward to keep progress mm -hmm. going um and eventually that's the other part if you if you took your foot off the gas you're going to find yourself in a in a deficit place of trying to catch up yeah and that's actually a great segue to you lewis i'd love to hear your uh perspective on this and specifically um have you seen or can you tell us about a company or campaign that you really felt like they hit the nail on the head when it comes to advertising authentically. Um, and what what did they do that kind of stuck with you? Well, I'm going to continue down the, the road first of what Shannon and Bing said, mm -hmm. that, that it has sort of retrenched from 2020. Uh, but I, yeah. I look at it differently, that that was a well-executed strategy that they were intentional about coming out and making a statement to primarily protect their brands and protect their businesses. But if we notice who made those statements, it wasn't the people who were in charge of strategy and budgets, it was their communication departments, all right? So, right. you know, when, when you look at it, you know, there was no CMOs putting themselves out front, all right? 
There were not even any CEOs putting themselves up front. It was the head of communications that made the statements, did the releases. And I think if, if you look at it you know, closely, it was a well-executed strategy. It got them off the hook for the moment of time. And now they can go back and do what they normally do. And uh, I think that that's sort of the, the tragedy of it all. But what you did see, the people who were already committed before Memorial Day 2020, they kind of leaned in. And whether that was, you know, the Procter & Gamble's of the world or whether that was the Pepsi's of the world or the McDonald's of the world. When you look at what McDonald's did with Travis Scott and the uh, burger, the Travis Scott meals, meal, uh, that was a real risk for them, all right? A real risk. And they leaned in and they took that risk and it paid off big time for them. It sort of changed the way people, the consumer looked at McDonald's and it changed the way that McDonald's said how they need to go to market because they just mm -hmm. didn't include a black guy that's leading culture. They included him authentically by like saying, what is your meal? And he told them what the meal was and they created this Travis Scott meal. So they authentically said, hey, we want to use someone who goes to McDonald's, who happens to be in pop culture, hip hop culture, black culture. And then we want to make sure that we authentically present him as part of their ecosystem. They did it and it paid off big time for them. That's, that's a great example. Um, Bing or Shannon, any other examples of companies that you feel like are doing it right? I mean, I think Dove is just a game changer in terms of how they really think about this space um, for women and for men. I mean, I think, you know, I think that one of the big, my big learnings as I've gone through the process of standing up Partners for Progress, which is Assembly Global Supplier Diversity, which I hate the word, so I like to call it inclusive investment, um, <laughs> because it's really, it. we are diversifying, we are diversifying our suppliers, but that's not the intention, right? So, but I think, you know, one of my key learnings, and I used to be the CMO of The Honest Company, and one of the things that while I was there, I did really love is like, if you are going to invest in these communities and you are going to have an intention towards developing these audiences, taking a stand in the things that are meaningful to them is really important. So when you think about what Dove is doing with the Crown Act, right, and how, you know, every, so every communication, right, has some visualization, representation, voices elevated, all of that, but the ability to double down in policy where these things actually get stuck and where they are inhibiting progress, right? Whether it be in, you know, talent, you know, talent, people feeling comfortable and safe in the workplace, right? Feeling like you're being discriminated against, whether it's, in, you know, sort of uh, quietly or more overtly, right? Where companies can double down and elevate some of those things that are really important to those groups of folks and groups of people is incredibly admirable. Like I yeah. really love, and then they, and then they broadcast that throughout their entire ecosystem. So like Lewis is saying, it's the reason all these positions, right, have been compromised is because they were, they were PR positions. They weren't integrated into the overarching goals and strategy and key objectives of the brands themselves or of the companies themselves. And then certainly, you know, the marketing teams didn't have a responsibility to continue that, you know, kind of that process and moving that forward. And so in the in the demonstration of Dove, right, it, it integrates in everything from the products they do to the policies they stand mm -hmm. for to their entirety of their communications ecosystem. And that I think is just best in class. Um, and same with like Old Spice and PNG, right? Is there a call yeah. to action at, in what you are doing that is actually, you know, actually investing and supporting the community? So I just think that was, I yeah. just, the beautiful, I just think what they are doing is just best in class as it, as it relates to investing in diverse and, and traditionally underserved communities. Yeah, I love what like what Skittles did with their Pride campaign with the rainbow yeah. Skittles. That kind of reminds them. me of that. I same, thought they were so amazing. Same. That was yeah. a great campaign. Um, yeah. And I want to kind of flip because there are companies obviously like Dove, like, um, Mars doing it right. 
But unfortunately, over the past few years, we've seen a backlash. I'm specifically thinking about Bud Light as an example with the trans ad, um, a backlash towards companies like that that have taken a strong stance on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion. Do you think, um, maybe we'll start with you, Shannon, because you're on that point, that this will impact the way advertisers were, will approach their campaigns moving forward? Or have you already started to see some examples of this? I think that there's, I think it created fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, the, the truth is, is that it was a commercial stunt um, in some ways, right? It was tied to their largest tentpole, one of their largest tentpole sponsorships. There was just a number of things of not really understanding the audience. And I think mm -hmm. understanding audiences and really and what kind of back to what I said before, which is what is meaningful for, for your audience, right? And then how can you intentionally come forward and be, you know, part of, reflective of, investing in that community? So then you can intentionally stand behind the decisions that you're making to grow your brands. And it will take people you know, people and companies with, I would say now a little bit of grit, right? To be yeah. like, you know what, this is, this is important. This is important for a number of reasons. It's important for our business. It's important for the people that we stand for. It is important because of our values, right? And I think being able to, to do that is really important. But I, I, and I, and I would just say like, that should be part of your process, right? Like, yeah. this is yeah. not something that you just go, oh, let's go do that. Right. And, and, and by the way, that is not the right way to be doing a strategic approach anyway. Right. So I think that's the part where it's like back into kind of aligning with your, with your business and your goals and your outcomes. And what is your, you know, 12, 24, 36 month plan. And how does that come to live and breathe yeah. and the customers that you want to have a relationship with, you need to understand them and think about that before you go. And then, and also that, you know, how you can, can truly really have intention behind that because then you can sort of stand up and really say, no, we did this very purposefully and we're, yeah. we're happy about that. And we're comfortable with that. And we believe this is the right thing for our business to be doing. And yeah, I know that behind those values, that in, but, right. I, but I do really think like something that is just a marketing thing is not the right, that is not the way in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, um, there are a lot of brands in the advertising, um, in our bands trying to basically advertise to a particular community for the first time, whether that's LGBTQ plus or, or uh, the black community, but they're worried about coming across as inauthentic. Um, how would you recommend that these brands navigate the landscape um, so that they can tap into existing cultural narratives? Um, would love to hear from you, you, Lewis, and then maybe Bing, you can add to that well, as well. Well, yeah. Chris, the brands that worry are the brands that don't do the work. I mean, because, you know, whatever campaign, whatever audience, if you do the work, you're not worried, all right? Right. Because you're going to do, you know, testing, you're going to do focus groups, you're going to do the whole process. So, you know, when you think about the brands that have made these big mistakes in the past, they all are major brands, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not new brands or small brands. They're brands with big budget, with lots of people, with big agencies. And the mistake came because they sort of took the audience for granted. They thought they could take something that works over here and make it work over here. Something that's this color, they can just make it work over here. If you do the work, you respect the audience, you do the process, you respect the process, and you have real goals attached to it, real goals, mm -hmm. then you're gonna do the work. So every time I see mistakes like this made, it just says, somebody didn't do the work. They dropped the ball, they didn't care enough, and they didn't have real long-term strategic goals because every time, you always say, who made that decision? Every, every single one of them, we can go back for decades and think about brands that dropped the ball and embarrassed themselves. And you're saying, who made that decision? Because right. they're so obvious, the work could not have been done. For sure. And it's very tricky because you're trying to balance those measurable sales outcomes with these communities um, without kind of 
without getting that backlash. And curious to hear your perspective on that being, um, on how, how brands can come across as authentic when they're trying to do this for the first time, second time, or continuing to do it. Yeah, I'll be the contrarian and give the, uh, I'll start with an, uh, an unpopular opinion. I think it depends on your brand. Um, I, I come from the school of Fox. I'm from the South where you should give a damn about your neighbor. But candidly, I don't think everyone should or can. Um, I think it, the larger the, uh, the brand that you are, and the larger the platform you are, the more likelihood you should give a damn about more inclusivity and narratives. But if you're just selling soap, I hate to pay, uh, pick on PNG in this regard, but if you're just picking on soap, I don't know that you need to talk about everybody. And so I think that's number one. I think the second is whenever we're trying to speak to communities, we have to be very specific. Uh, anyone trying to speak to everyone speaks to no one. Um, right. And I think the, the way I think about this, and I'll, I'll, I'll give some process sort of suggestions in a moment, but if you aren't going to do the right thing and speak specifically, then at least do the lucrative thing, which is speaking specifically. So I'll give an example. Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, rules all of humanity. So let's invoke some examples from, from my world in the media space. 20% of logged in users on YouTube drive 82% of viewing time. 10% of moviegoers in theatrical exhibitions drive 50% of the physical box office. I am almost certain that on Yelp, the wonderful opinionative Yelp elite are a minority of the platform and account for a majority of the consumed commentary. I'm certain of this. And I'm certain it looks very close to 2080. Uh, Chris, you can corroborate and or, and or deny that in a moment. Um, but the whole punchline is a minority always drives a majority of revenue, engagement, and so forth everywhere. It is just a fact. And so again, as a brand, if you're thinking about, should I speak up or not? It's not about whether you should or not. It's are you speaking up specifically to the core demo that you should most care about because they are buying the majority of your product. They are evangelizing your product most consistently and so forth. The question is, do you know who those people are? And at the very right. least, you need to be speaking up for them. Um, said another way, I was really perturbed over the past few years. I actually, well, let me go back to childhood. I remember being a kid in Tennessee and seeing a cover that said, um, America loves black people and people was crossed out and it said culture. And I think this is a very telling revelation, or at least it was in my like peon head as like a three-year-old or five-year-old, whatever it was of like, you cannot just profiteer off a group if you are not showing up for them, especially if you are, or they are rather a core customer base. So I think that's, that's the second principle of, if you're not going to do the right thing to do the right thing, that's fine. You've got your own MO, you got shareholders, whatever, do at least the lucrative thing, which is once again the same thing um and then the final thing i would say is uh it, it piggybacks off what uh, shannon and lewis have articulated in their really wonderful anecdotes with dove and mcdonald's but the best marketing is not actually under the cmo's remit the best marketing is actually the best product and if you don't have a product or you can't like change the composition or who's making a dove soap then at least the next best thing to product is a sustainable program. We all bemoan campaigns that are ephemeral. And so to show sincerely that you care about someone, you have to show that you are consistent. And so um, one way is, of course, ensuring that leadership is diverse. If leadership cannot be diverse, there are all sorts of other legal and accounting um, sort of creative structures that one can engage cultural consultants. Gold House, for instance, is a, is a cultural consultant for every major media company to make sure people don't let Scarlett Johansson play one of us again, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second important, no offense to Scarlett Johansson, uh, but offense <laughs> to our people. Um, uh, but the second piece is uh, outside of just talent, we also need to make sure that processes are in place and the processes are actually adopted and used so that when that talent inevitably leaves, because all humans will migrate, that all that great work can be sustained. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I agree with you on everything you said, except so there is a difference in so. And that's why PNG does Keep what me. they do because different groups, different ethnicities use different soaps for a reason. Because like everything, it's not all created the same or equal. And skin so is all different. That's why that's Dove fair. has been so uh, understanding, has done so well <laughs> because they know that. That's a good fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Um, so one last question for each of you, and then we can flip to a few minutes of Q&A. Um, uh, Shannon, you, you alluded to Partners for Progress. I love what Stagwell is doing around that. And of course, Yelp is partnering with you to up-level underrepresented small businesses. Super excited about that. Um, and, and, and things 
things are getting better. It's much better than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, there's much more inclusivity in advertising today than there was uh, 10, 20 years ago. But obviously, there is still room for improvement. I, I think we all need to do better. What is one thing that you hope to see in the next few years that you feel that brands should be doing now? Um, and Shannon, I'll start with you and then we'll uh, go to Lewis and, and end with Bing and go to Q&A. Yeah, I mean, I love this question because I think it actually just is a bow tying up like all the things that both Bing and Lewis have said as well, which is this is about sustainability of business, right? And if you're really thinking about the sustainability of a business, you have to be focused on who your audiences are and who your consumers are, both now and in the future. And if you pay attention to the data, the data will tell you everything you need to know, right? So if you're really thinking about where's the growth for our business going to come from, understanding the audiences and, and, the, and the nuances of those audiences, whether we're talking about soap or we're talking about you know, content and entertainment, or we're talking about, you know, sneakers. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's about making sure that you have an intentional design on really understanding and connecting with those audiences to make a sustainable plan for mm -hmm. how to connect with them, grow that relationship in a way that's intentional, but also shows up for them. Right. So I think that's the, I think it's about it's about thinking about what is your business, right? Because every brand, every company is thinking about the future growth of their business, right? There's a Fortune article that came out during the World Economic Forum that said like, you know, I think it's like 60 some odd percent of CEOs are worried about their businesses won't be even existing in 10 years if they don't figure their stuff out. So, you know, if that's the case, right? Like you have to understand where your growth is gonna come from. And I think there's so much opportunity in all the ways, it's not just good, it's good for business, right? Kind of, which is what Partners for Progress sort of stands for, which is like, how can we as a group and a community of people who sit at this intersection of investment, technology, consultative advice, selling, right? Reaching audiences, you know, reflecting audiences, like how can we uh, together as a group actually start to incorporate this thinking? So it's not just D and I, right? Mm -hmm. It's about actually how do we include the future, these audiences, which are the rising majority into your business plan so that we can, you can make the right investment in the right way and then carry that forward. And that will ultimately have a positive outcome on your PL and then on your bottom line um, that will benefit your shareholders, that will benefit your, your customers, that will benefit your company and will benefit your communities. Right. So yeah, that, that for me is like the big, what I tell brands all the time. I'm like, it's not a marketing stunt. This is not a campaign. This is a commitment over time, get on board, figure it out, right? What is your product? What is the things you're willing to do and commit to and start there? And then everything will build around it like everything else that we do, <laughs> right? Yeah, so. For sure, love that. Um, and then uh, Lewis, love to hear from you and then Bing really quickly from you. And we have one question in the Q&A. Well, I, I would say that the best thing they can do is better understand culture and how culture yeah. impacts just about every single industry and everything that consumers do. Uh, so, you know, most people, when they think of culture, the easiest thing to think of is, is music, fashion, and things like that. But it goes way beyond those particular categories and industries and how you engage that culture into trying to engage a consumer. Because we know Consumers do some of everything. The, the consumer who buys gym shoes also loves music. They also love soft drinks. They also love quick service restaurants. So understanding how that thread goes through a consumer's lifestyle, understanding how culture impacts every sort of uh, point of their particular lifestyle and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we, we've been saying for years, you know, Black culture just doesn't influence black community it influences all communities and we see that through multiple 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 marketers who've taken black culture and extended way beyond the black community so i think if they can understand that and embrace that i think they'll go a long way 
I think the simplest thing to do is mm-hmm. just hire more young people. Now I know young people are a pain in the ass to manage. And so I think <laughs> giving them strict parameters is also important. But um, the reason for this is um, just to piggyback off what Lewis said, you can't know cultural communities unless you live them. Full empathy is not something that you can just teach. You have to actually have someone who grew up in that era. And so to have that DNA on the inside, I think is really important. The other unfortunate sort of reality is diversifying C-suites is a generational investment. That does not happen overnight. We saw this the hard way with a lot of the diverse CMOs in Hollywood over the past three years. And so, again, I think hiring young people, nurturing them and so forth is, is one of the easiest ways to change this. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Bing, Lewis, and Shannon. This was an insightful conversation for me and I hope it was for our audience. We are already at time. I feel like we could talk about this all day, Uh, but we are going to move to the next panel. So thank you, the three of you for joining us today. Thanks Thanks, everybody.